the technique of examining the fundus of the eye is called ophthalmoscopy. Although there are several types of ophthalmoscopy, in this video, we will learn to perform binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy. The technique is called indirect because, the fundus is seen through a condensing lens. A real and inverted image is formed between the observer and condensing lens. In this video we are going to cover optics of the instrument, demonstrate its setup and controls and actual clinical examination. The optics of the eye do based on Gullstrand's principle that involves three separate beams, that all pass through the patient's pupil. These consists of one illumination beam and two separate viewing beams, one for each of the examiner's eye. Binocularity is achieved by artificially reducing the observer's IPD to approximately 15 mm by the help of prisms and mirrors. A handheld condensing lens is used to create a real and inverted image of the retina that sits between examiner and lens. This enables the stereoscopic visualization of retina. For maximum stereopsis, the patient's pupil must be well dilated to allow all three beams to pass through it. If pupil is poorly dilated one of the beam will fall outside the pupil, and stereopsis is therefore lost. IDOs can be of various types such as, a wireless indirect model or, wired indirect model. It can be either head mounted, or spectacle mounted IDO. There are various elements of IDO. The key elements of IDO includes Illumination system A rheostat to adjust the intensity or brightness of the beam Aperture adjustment knob A larger aperture light spot is used for a fully dilated pupil, and intermediate and smaller apertures for a smaller or undilated pupil. The diffuser is recommended for more extensive peripheral retinal examination. Additionally, filters are also incorporated into the viewing system. A red-free filter can be used to view blood vessels, membranes and retinal nerve fiber layer defects. Red-free filter, filters out the red light and, blood vessels are shell outed against the green background. A yellow filter is used for light-sensitive patients. Cobalt blue filters can be used to do fluorescent angioscopy, and to examine the cornea with fluorescence. On the bottom, there is adjustment for the interpupillary distance. In some IDOs, there is a lever underneath the optics unit for synchronized adjustment of convergence and parallax, for high quality stereoscopic fundus images through small pupil size. The aerial image is formed using a condensing lens. There are multiple lenses available for the examination. The power of lens decides the working distance, the field of view, and the magnification of the image. As the power of the condensing lens increases, the field of view increases, but image magnification, and working distance decreases. The surface of lenses could either be biconvex, planoconvex, or aspheric to avoid spherical aberrations during the examination. Usually steeper surface, which is indicated by the white markings on the rim, faces the patient. 20 diopter lens is the most commonly used binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy lens. It has magnification up to 3.13 times, and 60 degrees dynamic field of view. Viewing pathology near the aura serratu is easier with a 30 diopter lens. The 30 diopter lens sacrifices some magnification, but offers a larger 75 degrees dynamic field of view. This lens is used in pediatric patients and in small pupils. The panretinal 2.2 lens uniquely combines magnification nearly that of the 20 diopter lens, with a field of view approaching that of the 30D lens. To aid visualization of the peripheral retina, indentation is needed to bring the area of interest to the focus. Cotton tip applicator or, specialized metallic instruments with various designs are used for this purpose. Thimble depressor is commonly used depressor for scleral indentation. Now, as we are familiarized with the instrument, let's start with the clinical examination. First explain the procedure to the patient. 
Dilate the pupil well with tropicamide and phenylephrine drops. Adjust the headband, so that the scope is secure on your head. Eyepieces should be as close to the pupil as possible, and should be perpendicular to pupillary axis. Switch on the light source. Adjust your interpupillary distance, and make sure the light spot is well centered from both oculars at arm's distance. Move your head sideways, and check that your finger is still in the visual field. Patient should lay flat in a reclining chair with slight extension of head, with room for you to move freely around the head. Room lights should be dimmed for better visualization. Condensing lens is grasped between bulb of thumb and tip of flexed index finger. Middle finger holds one lid, and it also acts as a pivot for movement of the lens. Thumb of other hand can be used to hold another lid. Start with the minimum intensity. Patients both eyes should be opened while examination. Throw light into the patient eye from an arm distance and observe for red reflex. Interpose the condensing lens in the path of the beam of light, keeping a watch on the reflex close to the patient eye. Slowly move the lens away from the eye, till the image of the retina is clearly seen. This is usually at the focal length of the lens. Start with a peripheral view, as this will help acclimate a patient to the light. Start by getting a patient to look in the direction of area of the interest, and stand opposite the clock hour to be examined. Move around the head of the patient to examine different quadrants in sequential manner. You can also ask the patient to fixate on outstretched hand. Maintain a common line of sight by imagining that the fundus, the center of the patient pupil, the center of the condensing lens and the examiner's visual axis are all connected by an imaginary line. Examination of the more sensitive posterior pole should be left until last. Examination of the peripheral retina is a challenge in extremes of gaze. Because shape of the pupil becomes elliptical and cuts off the illumination beam, visualization of fundus become difficult. Variable pupil function as described earlier, can be helpful in such situation. The peripheral most of the retina and pars plana region bows inward, making direct visualization of this portion difficult. Depressors are needed to indent clearer, pushing the peripheral portion inward to bring an area of interest into focus. Scleral indentation is an important technique for the examination of peripheral retina. The two key principles to observe are, appropriate placement of the indenter, and to indent in the correct direction. To position your scleral indenter, first ask the patient to look in the direction of gaze, that s opposite to the area that you want to indent. Then place the indenter in the skin crease, and it gently slide backwards over the globe. Whilst holding in it place, ask the patient to switch their gaze back towards indenter. Once in place, you need to apply very gentle pressure on the sclera to indent it sufficiently to view anterior retina up to the aura serrata. Vasivagal reflex can occur while indentation, so during the indentation keep looking for any ominous signs such as dizziness, tinnitus, nausea etc. In this video, as we have covered the essential clinical optics, instrument control and examination techniques. We hope that, now you have the better understanding of the instrument and how to use it. Finally, as with all clinical skills, indirect ophthalmoscopy can only be mastered with repeated and regular practice. So, keep practicing until you are comfortable with the indirect ophthalmoscopy, and all the best.